Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce Dr. Joe Gull gone uh, today. Uh, we were just reminiscing. He was an intern. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary. Uh, I told him he was five years old when he started. Uh, obviously, uh, 20 years has gone by in a in a quick flash. Joe is a international expert on the topic that he's going to be talking about: uh, psychology and mental health, American Indians and other uh, indigenous populations. Uh, Joe has collaborated with tribal communities for over 25 years to critique uh, conventional mental health services and to harness uh, and utilize traditional culture and spirituality uh, for advancing uh, the care of indigenous uh, populations. Uh, highly published in the area, a uh, number of career awards and fellowships have been achieved. Uh, spent a year long residency at the Center of Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Uh, Joe attended uh, West Point, uh, the US uh, Military Academy, uh, then transferred over to Harvard uh, and got his bachelor's degree, uh, did his master's and PhD work at uh, uh, the University of Illinois. And as we've already said, he did his internship here at, uh, at McLean. Uh, he's a fellow in the Association of Psychological Science uh, and numerous other uh, APA divisions. He's an enrolled member of the Gravant uh, Tribal uh, Nation in beautiful Montana. Uh, he served briefly as the Chief Administrative Officer for the uh, Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. He's been at the uh, University of Michigan for almost 10 years, uh, and served as a Professor of Psychology and Professor of uh, American Culture as well as director of the Native American Studies program. Returned to uh, Harvard about a year and a half ago, uh, where he serves as a professor of anthropology, uh, professor of global health and social medicine, and serves as the faculty director uh, of the Harvard University uh, Native American uh, program. Joe, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thanks, it's such a pleasure to be back and to have a chance to talk with you today. Um, I understand that time is uh, a bit short, so I'm gonna dive right in, and I want to preserve enough time for you to have some reflections or exchange at the end, so let's uh, get to it. Um, so just by way of opening, you've heard some of the background. Uh, you hear some of the research I do, which does have to do with thinking about alternatives to conventional mental health services in Indian country. The talk today is really about why I have tried to embark on pursuing those alternatives, uh, because it has to do with some of the reluctance of many people in Indian country or American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian communities throughout the U.S. Uh, to embrace and welcome conventional mental health services, even evidence-based or empirically supported mental health services. And so uh, I am a clinically trained, community engaged psychologist. I have attended very deeply to cultural process and practice and all the work that I do, in part because I have collaborated with Indian communities throughout my entire career. And so today, again, I want to explain indigenous community misgivings that I have encountered throughout my career about evidence-based practice in mental health services because I think it is an illuminating window into how we tend to think about our own endeavor as clinicians and as uh, advocates of uh, empirically supported treatments so we have a sense for what some of those objections might look like and begin to creatively imagine how we might address some of those in a more compelling manner. I should say that I also could give a talk on why Indian country needs empirically supported treatments and evidence-based practice, but that would be a different talk and that would be something that's probably more familiar to you um, and it's not so easy as you'll hear from these objections to simply assert that uh, there has to be ways to argue it. Um, and so I'm also the president-elect of the Society of Indian Psychologists right now. And this talk in part originated from being asked to explain, kind of on behalf of the Society of Indian Psychologists, what the concerns are about evidence-based practice in mental health. So that's a bit of background just to help orient you to what I'll be talking about today. Hmm. Let's start then with an early career lesson I had. Can you speak a little louder? You know, people Oh, okay, sure, I can try to do that. 
I'm going to start a bit with an early career lesson to give you an orientation to how I came up upon thinking about these issues in the way that I do. Um, as you probably know, there are mental health disparities in many American Indian communities today. In some respects, we have epidemic levels of distress, particularly in the areas of domain, in the domains of trauma, suicide, addiction. Um, and our community mental health services tend to be deeply underfunded. Uh, the organization responsible for providing health care to Indian communities is the Indian Health Service, a federal branch of the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, and it receives maybe 40 cents on the dollar for what other federal health programs are able to provide to their constituents. So there remains, in many respects, a large unmet need. So when it comes to mental health disparities in American Indian, Alaska Native, or indigenous communities in the US, we have some pronounced mental health problems, even as we have underfunded mental health services. And so we might assume that the answer is quite simple and straightforward. Why don't we just simply expand mental health services, get the funding, get the uh, professionals hired, and so on. That should address the problem, right? Well, it was early in my career where this simple, straightforward solution seemed a bit more complicated by some work I did at home on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation uh, where my people live. And basically, this early research that I undertook uh, at that point in my career was fairly open-ended and discovery-oriented. Um, it was somewhat anthropological, if you will, which is not surprising now that I'm in the Department of Anthropology with these interests. My particular uh, goal was to try to understand local construals of culture, drinking, and depression, and the relationships between those. In other words, to set at bay or to bracket my own professional understandings about these things and try to hear from everyday people on the ground how they thought about these issues. And what emerged from a number of the interviews I did with an extended family there was a particular case study that I published on in various respects with a man who decided um, in our partnership together to go by his Indian name, which translates as traveling the thunder. And in talking with Traveling Thunder about the origins of addiction and depression um, in our community, um, he really offered what anthropologists refer to as an explanatory model for these things um, that base, was based on uh, the way he talked about four historical periods or epics that inform um, reservation society. So in his explanatory model, there were these four eras. The first era is an era I labeled paradise. It really had to do with a pre-colonial existence, how Indian people lived prior to European contact. And according to Traveling Thunder, this particular era was characterized by perfect harmony and balance, owing, as he said, to a strict observation of custom, traditional custom, indigenous custom, and that's what kept everything uh, in balance. Um, but then, he said, in this second era, we entered a period of conquest that followed from colonial contact. And this had to do with European incursion and ultimately subjugation and domination that resulted in the annihilation of indigenous custom, the breaking, the repudiation, the subjugation of the very custom that he said held things together prior to this contact. This initiated a third era he identified uh, as an era of loss. It's the era of these post-colonial effects the results of the colonial effort on everyday lives. Basically, he talked about anime. Anime is a term that means no name, loss of identity. It means a lack of purpose, a lack of who you are, what you're supposed to be doing, how you belong, and so on. Um, and he traced out how this lack of identity and purpose would lead to pathology, like addiction and depression and so on. And very interestingly, he identified explicitly the quote white man system unquote as being the pathogenic force here. And he didn't talk about other things that we're familiar with in professional mental health. It was this white man system that he identified as the original cause of these problems. Fortunately, he didn't stop there. He said there was a fourth era, one that had, was inaugurated really starting in the 1970s with the Red Power Movement in Indian Rights, an era of revitalization in which the possibility for a post-colonial remedy uh, appeared. And this involved, as he said, a return to indigenous, especially sacred indigenous custom. So you can see this really is sort of a circle in the sense that there's this custom that keeps things in harmony and balance um, before contact. Contact disrupts that. It leads to these effects, which uh, are the source of these uh, mental health problems. Um, but there's the possibility to redress that or remedy that now by the return to the custom that had been disrupted at that time. So in terms of this explanatory model, Traveling Thunder identified a very clear pathological process. And this is right in his words, if I had time, I would quote the things that show how these uh, line up exactly as I place them here. That cultural repression through colonization leads to anime, 
which then leads to substance abuse, that leads to depression, that leads to this sense of worthlessness, and therefore suicide. This is what Traveling Thunder said uh, was the explanation for how these things happened. Importantly, he offered very little elaboration of personal distress. He didn't offer anything uh, in terms of biological or psychological even accounts of these things. Um, he didn't talk about broken brains or um, polluted genes or uh, family dynamics from childhood or anything like that. He really emphasized history, culture, and spirituality. He rarely talked about individual experiences at all. It was mostly as a group or communal or collective response to these conditions. Moreover, in terms of the pathogenic aspects of the white man system, he was clearly designating colonization as the original uh, foundational cause of American Indian distress. In doing so, he emphasized systemic factors over intrapersonal factors or even interpersonal factors within um, tribal families, tribal communities, and the uh, shared community aspects of these vulnerabilities. Now, I compare this to the concept of historical trauma, which is now everywhere in Indian country. You can hear it even percolating out into mental health circles more broadly, um, which is a way of talking about pretty much these same processes, with only one distinction that I'll just mention as an aside, which is Traveling Thunder himself never used the word trauma, um, in part probably because trauma has this psychological component to it, and Traveling Thunder was really not talking much about psychology, except for because I was framing some things in that way he felt obliged to address. So historical trauma is capturing this even though it's more psychologized than what Traveling Thunder had to say um, back in the late 1990s when I did this work. Well, you might wonder, as I did in response to this, what is the relevance then, particularly of psychosocial interventions and mental health services, if this is the explanatory model that accounts for these uh, difficulties? Here's what Traveling Thunder had to say about that. I guess it's like a war, but they're not using bullets anymore. They want to wipe us out, and therefore the Indian problem will be gone forever. But they're using a more shrewder way than the old style of bullets. If you look at the big picture, you look at your past, your history, where you come from, and look at your future, where the white man's leading you, I guess you could make a choice. Where do I want to end up? And I guess a lot of people want to end up looking good to the white man then it'd be a good thing to do. Go to the white psychiatrists in the Indian Health Service and say, ah, go ahead and rid me of my history, my past, and brainwash me forever so I can be like a white man. I guess that'd be a choice each individual will have to make. And so in this declaration, it seemed very clear to me that not only was Traveling Thunder seeing mental health treatment as a cross-cultural encounter, he was also identifying mental health services as a potentially neo-colonial endeavor in which professional or uh, Euro-American cultural proselytization of a sort was on offer. And Indian people, as you might know, have been uh, uh, reached out to by uh, Christian missionaries for a good part of our history as part of the assimilation campaign. And so I use this term proselytization because I'm trying to draw uh, a connection between mental health services and Christian missionary work in this sense. So, when it comes then to how to resolve the dilemma of these problems in Indian country, the simple expansion of mental health services may not be quite so apparent because of two problems. The problem of cultural difference, the kinds that Traveling Funders pointing out, that is that um, professional practices, understandings, and interventions emerge from uh, cultural settings that are quite distinctive for those of American Indian communities. Um, and yet the American Indian cultural practices persist in really important ways, uh, whether it's cosmology, it's links to sociality and to selfhood, and a good part of my um, writing has to do with expose, exploring and exposing these kinds of links. And the norms, routines, and logics of the mental health clinic are not those that are apparent in many of the tribal communities. Beyond difference, however, which you could imagine people could talk about and sort through, there is this problem of cultural dominance, which makes this effort even more uh, difficult. That is, there's this legacy of colonial subjugation. Um, it reached, um, in one form, uh, industrial residential boarding schools throughout the United States that were designed to assimilate Indian children uh, under the mantra, kill the Indian, save the man. The idea, of course, was that Indian people were, hope, were savage and needed civilization, and so Christianity and education were the ways to bring that about, which required a kind of eradication of cultural practice, identity, and uh, process. Um, and these power asymmetries that gave rise to that persist today. So it's important to recognize that cultural dominance colors these efforts as well. 
Let me now shift into talking about diverse therapeutic traditions as a way of then trying to set up a little more how uh, there might be resistance to empirically supported or evidence-based practice in mental health throughout indigenous communities. As you probably all know, evidence-based practice is primarily concerned uh, with mental health therapies in the context of what we're considering today. All therapies are human cultural artifacts. There is no culture-free or transcendent notion about these things. And so the comparison of therapeutic logics uh, can be illuminating with respect to thinking about these issues. So let me just review a bit of professional mental health treatments. Uh, these should be really familiar, and um, if you have a different opinion about them, we can maybe talk about them at the end here. Uh, there's obviously within mental health psychosocial and psychopharmacological approaches. I'm really talking about psychosocial treatments today. And uh, this is, tends to be in its ideal form uh, advocated uh, in what looks like evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice has been characterized in psychology at least as a three-legged stool that's built on empirically supported treatments, client values and preferences, and clinician expertise, with really an emphasis on empirically supported treatments. That's in large part where the attention, the action, the funding, the research, and resources tend to go. So empirically supported treatments, as you know, uh, follow from experimental demonstrations of causal efficacy using randomized controlled trials. That there are cause and effects that can be reliably established between treatments and interventions and outcomes and benefits. And of course, once that's replicated, uh, you can have favorable efficacy um, demonstrated across different studies. Um, then you start to have confidence that you've captured the cause and effect relationships. Then there's the uh, expansion of these uh, research efforts to effectiveness trials, which are more forgiving in terms of some of the artificial aspects of experiments. It can let go some of the controls a bit to ensure broader generalizability. Once all of this has been put together, ideally speaking, then you can take this evidence and incorporate into clinical practice guidelines that professional associations and organizations adopt and promote and disseminate and implement these efforts throughout the mental health services sector. Now, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, why evidence-based practice? Again, um, the need for mental health treatments eclipses its availability. Um, most people, as you know, with mental health problems don't get treatment. Of those who do get treatment, they often get these treatments that have not been rigorously evaluated. And of course, no, not surprising that clinicians tend to believe that their treatments work best, whether they've been researched or studied in any formal ways or not. But clinician beliefs in efficacy can be mistaken. Um, everyone believes what they're doing is helpful, and yet we know from the history of mental health, even the recent history from like the 1990s when I was in graduate school, that things can uh, proliferate throughout mental health services that are erroneous or even harmful. Um, some of these treatments have been shown to cause harm. I think about facilitated communication with kids with autism. I think about the epidemic of multiple personality disorder and repressed memories of sexual abuse from the 90s and so on. And so I default back to the eminent uh, clinical psychologist Paul Meal, who talked about the importance of credentialed knowledge, knowledge that has credentials precisely because it's been grounded in research. Well, there are implications that follow from evidence-based practice if we accept this uh, overview. Um, one of the implications, I think, is there's an effort to standardize approaches or techniques in psychosocial mental health services. Um, another is that efficacy itself is seen primarily to depend upon technical mechanisms. It's really about the treatments themselves and the things that those treatments contain in them that can alter someone's experience if applied properly. Therapists, therefore, are roughly interchangeable. The goal is to train therapists to be able to use these techniques, but any competent therapist should be able to replace any other competent therapist and be able to offer the treatments. Therapist expertise is therefore comprised heavily of technical proficiency, but also, of course, of client tailoring. There's the interpersonal aspect of trying to reach a client where they're at. Um, and yet, I think it's fair to say that it's more transparent or taken for granted that the client tailoring is something that people can do. It's really fidelity to technique that's emphasized within the empir empirically supported treatment world really gets a lot more attention and coverage than something like client tailoring. And so you see here I, what I want to draw out is an emphasis on the technical over the relational that I see pervading in how we think about evidence-based practice and empirically supported treatments. It's not to say that relational doesn't matter. It is to say that the technical is really where the training, where the action, where the research, and so on is. Let me talk now instead, in contrast, to draw out some differences here, um, some aspects of American Indian therapeutic tradition. 
American Indian people are really diverse and there's lots of uh, different practices we might um, pull off. Um, there, there are higher order commonalities that um, I'll draw out in a moment, but I want to start with a Northern Plains example. And this example is drawn from this book, The Price of a Gift, which is co-produced by the late community psychologist Gerald Mohat and a Lakota medicine man named Joseph Eagle Elk. Um, Joseph Eagle Elk lived on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation in South Dakota, and Joseph Eagle Elk was known as a Hayoka. Uh, Hayoka is a ritual role that uh, persists among Lakota people today, but can be traced back to ritual life prior to the reservation and much earlier, um, in which one has been pursued or chased by the thunder beings and really coerced almost into accepting this ritual role. And part of this ritual role entails uh, healing powers and healing practices. And so most Hayokas are also um, doctors or medicine people. And so Joe Eagle Elk was one of these people. And in this book, he talks about his life and times and some of his cases. And I want to just um, recount for you one of his cases so that you can get a sense for the kind of therapeutic rationale or logic that undergirds some of these works. The case I want to bring before you is called The Fish and the Man in the book. It's not very long. You can read it if you want to know more detail about it. But essentially, Eagle Elk was consulted by an Indian Health Service psychologist, a white guy who was in Wyoming working with a patient. And in uh, Wyoming, uh, this patient um, apparently had di been diagnosed with cancer and therefore was quite depressed. And so the therapist contacted Eagle Elk because he had known him from attending ceremonial practices and so on in South Dakota and inquired about whether Joe could maybe consult ceremonially some of his spirits to see if there's anything that could be done for this man who was suffering from cancer and related depression. Eagle Elk reported that this was not typical practice. Usually someone has to come to ceremony to consult spirits in that way, but that he was willing to try it. And so he went into ceremony, he consulted the spirits during that ceremony, and he said, to my surprise, the spirits spoke right up. And they explained that cancer is like a flower it can bloom, it can grow, but it can also shrink and its growth and development can be arrested. And so it said that this uh, cancer would be arrested, but in order for the chance of it to go away, the patient would need to do something more. Specifically, what the patient needed to do was to go fishing. The patient needed to go catch a fish, unhook the fish, hold it in its hands, look it in the eye, wish it a long life, pray to it, and then let the fish go back into the waters. And when he would do that, the spirit said, perhaps the fish might take something with him. The implication being he might take the cancer away from the man. Well, Eagle Elk reported this back to the therapist. The therapist said, okay, well, I'll talk to the patient. And together, the therapist and the patient sought to go fishing. Now, apparently, it took some time for this to happen, like there was a year or more before they finally um, were out fishing. Um, they went to the river and tried to fish and couldn't catch a fish, so they went to a pond where there was greater likelihood and they still couldn't catch a fish, so they went to a place where you pay to fish in a pond that had been stopped um, and uh, still couldn't catch a fish, so the owner had pity on them and said, here, I just stopped this pond. Throw in your hook, you can't help but pull a fish out. So the patient throws in a hook, pulls the fish out. The therapist stands back to give him privacy. He unhooks the fish, holds it in his hands, looks it in the eye, wishes it a long life, and begins to talk to it. And the therapist doesn't know what he said. It was private. But at the end of this exchange, the fish apparently, this is witnessed by this therapist now, um, and I've heard it secondhand besides in this book, the fish made a sound. And that sound was something like, according to the guy I've heard it secondhand from, wow, wow. This so shocked the patient that he almost dropped the fish. But a, great, a sense of like, uh, energy, a surge of, of good feeling, and a sense that something that's remarkable had really happened, he released the fish back into the water and they left. Now in this account, Eagle Elk goes on to explain that not that long thereafter, the patient died. And Eagle Elk is trying to puzzle around what was going on in this case that could account for these events. Um, and what he ultimately concludes is this that actually the fish had talked to this patient, um, but the patient did not know what the fish had said. And what should have happened, what normally would happen, is he would have come to ceremony and the spirits would have interpreted what the fish had to say, and maybe something would have turned out differently if that had happened. But Eagle Elk surmised, uh, the therapist and the patient were maybe caught in between two ways of knowing. They were between the white man way and between the Lakota way. They could not lend their whole mind 
to the Lakota way, he said, and therefore that's probably why they weren't able to come to ceremony and this event occurred. So I wanted to set that forth to draw, draw out some principles, some aspects of the logic of these therapeutic practices for us here next. And I can't see any more on here, so I'm going to have to look unless there's a way to touch that. Oh, there we go. So in terms of drawing out some aspects of this therapeutic tradition, the thing to note is this. A given healer's ritual protocols may be standardized, but the recommended treatments often are not. There's no evidence that there's ever been a recommendation to go fishing to help someone who has cancer and is depressed. Um, Eagle Elk never talked about that ever happening before. Or it's never been documented that I know of in any work with Lakota people. So completely new, a different, unusual, distinctive. Efficacy in this ritual form of doctrine depends on, this is a religious concept in many respects, philosophical concept, uh, translates something like will and power, which has to do with a person's ability to muster their power toward making desirable things happen, um, willpower of persons involved rather than technical mechanisms. There's nothing that's done in terms of technique, it's more about the persons involved unifying their hearts, their thoughts, their concentration upon the good things that are supposed to happen. Healers are not interchangeable, but rather remain the single most important therapeutic variable. You go to the healer who can help you with this problem and the person you think has power of the right kind. Um, but you wouldn't just go to anybody, you go to the one who it makes the most sense to do. Competent ritual management of associated interpersonal interactions is crucial. The, the, the ceremony has to be done correctly, Everyone involved has to be of the right mindset. You certainly wouldn't want someone there who is intoxicated or uh, aggrieved or harboring ill will against a person who needs help. Um, and it's the job of the medicine person to manage all that. Um, and especially because this is not just about human beings, it's relationships with those above or, or, or spirit beings who have powers greater than human powers and who are bringing uh, their effort to benefit humans. Violations of ritual protocol and ill will among participants are dangerous for patients. So there's a sense in which these ceremonies are viewed a little bit with some fear, which is in part why picking the right person to do it, it matters a lot. So fear can be an intelligible response to ritual exercises of power. I draw this out in part to draw just one simple single contrast here, which is this emphasis, as I'll say, on the relational over the technical. There's really not much technique happening here. What there is, in fact, are people, persons. I don't just mean human persons. I mean a more expanded concept of persons who are together through relationship, um, putting together their uh, powers of mind and concentration and desire and wish and will to bring good things about. This helps me, I think, to want to uh, emphasize the nomothetic ideographic distinction that I think um, is apparent in this comparison. The nomothetic, as you know, is that which is general across cases, applicable to individuals, but usually in probabilistic terms. So you can't predict always whether a certain individual will have a benefit. But in general, as we do in psychotherapy with empirically supported treatments, expect that therapies are likely to help um, individuals when you work with them. That contrasts with the ideographic which has to do with that which is distinctive to a given case and applicable only to a unique individual. Well, I point this out because I want us to compare the nomothetic aspirations of professional mental health treatments, especially empirically supported or evidence-based in the ways I've described, in contrast to the ideographic commitments of at least some forms of indigenous healing practices. So again, the fishing cure is not nomothetic. It is not something that would be replicated or duplicated or ever happen again necessarily. It's utterly distinctive to that case and that person with that consultation. And presumably lots of other treatments might be like that. So it leads us to wonder then, if we're thinking about these kinds of therapeutic rationales or logics, could there even be an evidence-based form of some of these traditional healing practices? If it's not nomothetic, if it's not replicable, if there's no mechanism that can be counted on, what would it mean to be evidence-based? That's just one example. If I had time, I could go into lots of other distinctions between these systems. Dualism, uh, that is mind-body split, or the idea that mental health is separate from the rest of health versus a kind of holism in which 
mental disorders or psychopathology are not really seen as all that distinct, either in cause or in treatment from lots of other maladies. Uh, the secular divide versus the sacred, this is huge. In indigenous communities, the therapeutic is almost invariably understood as sacred, as religious, as involving powers and beings, the holy or God or what have you. Um, the rational versus the mystical, um, Eagle Elk and all people who work with power and who are uh, engaged in ceremony will tell you that there's so much that they don't know and that we can't know as human beings because our powers of reason are too weak to really understand those powers. And of course, the technical versus the relational, which I've tried to draw out here. I think I'll skip that, but I will talk about here the presumption of psychological mindedness. And this is something I think is really important. Psychosocial interventions tend to require or even orient or socialize patients into forms of psychological mindedness. Psychological mindedness is the capacity or quality that some human beings have um, that uh, lends itself well to psychotherapy and psychosocial interventions of the sort that we're familiar with. Um, it entails the responsibility for managing the self an introspective reflexivity, a self-awareness, a willingness to explore the self and to create and fashion a self through those explorations, through insight and so on, a cultivation of fairly deep interiority, a sense that we have many rooms and we're well furnished within, uh, and an expressive form of self-referential talk. These are the sorts of things that comprise candidates for psychotherapy where things could work out very well the thing that's interesting, though, is that psychological mindedness is one particular modality of human experience. And people have more or less capacity in it. And I would submit to you that most peoples in the world are not particularly psychologically minded. And so our therapeutic efforts, our interventions and treatments tend to presume this. But what might be happening for peoples for whom this is not the case, whether it has to deal with class-based differences, gender differences, cultural differences, is the prerequisite of bringing people on board with psychological mindedness and of teaching and training them how to become psychologically minded as part and parcel of therapeutic intervention. So this sets up in some ways the differing therapeutic logics I'm trying to set forth and some of the assumptions and underpinnings of what counts as empirically supported treatment um, for purposes of setting out now um, what some um, native communities have taught me about a different approach to these sorts of problems and their solutions. It's what I call here an alternative or alternative science. When it comes to indigenous community mental health discourse, what I notice everywhere I go in talking and people in multiple different kinds of communities about these kinds of issues is a distinct but somewhat parallel form of psychiatric discourse that is different than professional psychiatric discourse. It contests and recasts key concepts and approaches in ways that bear some uh, awareness and can be quite illuminating. Again, it's evident wherever I've been and I choose here to really summarize this across four different domains. One domain is the nature of the problem. One domain has to do with the aspiration or the outcome that is desired. One domain has to do with what intervention um, is. And one has to do with evaluation and how that might be undertaken. And you can imagine there's a lot to say about these things. I'm just going to do excerpts and highlights today to try and get us a sense for what I'm talking about. So in terms of these four domains, one I said has to do with the nature of the problem. And when I am in Indian communities, I do not hear people talking about DSM disorders. Um, um, they are not talking about even technical language like depression um, or, or um, PTSD, those sorts of things. Uh, they, I think um, the rejection has to do in part because these are so radically decontextualized. Um, and um, it's also the case that DSM is selectively incomplete in the kinds of things it has formulated. So in Indian country, we have a lot of rage. It's a rage that can come out, particularly when people have been drinking or using substances and in other kinds of things like that. But there really isn't a disorder of rage in the DSM to capture and describe those phenomena and how you would manage that clinically. Or disorders of identity. A big thing that people talk about, as Traveling Thunder did when it comes to anime, is all about cultural identity and the need for a healthy cultural identity after um, decades or even centuries of assault on uh, indigenous identity. 
And of course, measurement issues of uh, various sorts. It's been demonstrated through psych epi in Indian communities that depression, it's either low or there's measurement problems with uh, assessing or ascertaining what's going on in depression-like kinds of experiences. Same with internalizing disorders more generally. These epi surveys tend to find low rates of internalizing pathology. And the question is, is that real or is it an artifact of methodology? What's going on? Not DSM disorders, but rather the problem is one that today is labeled as historical trauma. I already told you about Traveling Thunder. You get a sense for what the historical trauma has to be about. It is about a radical recontextualization of these problems. It ha a tra historical trauma is really about two old familiar concepts that are wedded together, historical oppression and psychological trauma. You put these together and you kind of have this notion of historical trauma. There are four C's of historical trauma that I've tried to draw out in other research to describe what people mean by this. Uh, it's colonial in origin. It's collective in impact. It's cumulative in its effects over time. And most importantly, it's cross-generational, that something is inherited. People assert through historical trauma that if your ancestors uh, were victims of a massacre by the United States Army, that grandchildren or great-grandchildren today are at risk for things as a result of something being passed or carried intergenerationally. And obviously, as you can imagine, epigenetics has become a really exciting domain of inquiry as a possible explanation for this. So again, it's pretty familiar to what Traveling Thunder had to say, although as I mentioned before, Traveling Thunder was not particularly psychological. This is more psychological than that. That's the domain of the problem, but there's also the domain of what is aspired to, what is the desired outcome for interventions or mental health services. I'll submit to you that it's not neoliberal individualism, um, in which we have free agents navigating free markets in autonomous pursuit of happiness and wealth. Um, this is not what most people in Indian communities are after, but instead some uh, form of relational selfhood um, that recognizes first and foremost kinship roles and obligations. This is less about the self independently and uniquely charting its own path and more about the self in configuration to key others and responsible through various duties and obligations to take care of kin and family in, in um, conventionalized ways. It includes beyond that a responsibility to and for non-human relatives, whether it's local landforms, whether it's the whole uh, panoply of spirit beings that populate indigenous worlds. Um, and it gives rise, I think, to what I think of as social emotions. We remember Ekman's six basic psychology, uh, psychological emotions. Um, well, I think that in Indian country, people are less interested in those kind of decontextualized ideas of emotion and talk a lot more about these kinds of things. Pity, respect, loneliness, jealousy, pouting, hostility, suspicion, resentment, love. People will talk to you about disorders of jealousy. Um, the entire religious system tends to be, and some of our communities is built on the idea that respect moves up the status hierarchy all the way up to those above while pity moves down. Um, and so these kinds of, if you will, relational or social emotions predominate um, indigenous life and the English words for these things are much more uh, commonly used by some people than other kinds of emotional language. So the aspiration can be quite different as well. Moreover, as you can imagine, intervention is understood differently too. So not empirically supported treatments of evidence-based practice. Um, in fact, people I talk to um, usually tend to say, you know, we don't need that kind of outside stuff, um, we have a different approach. And so empirically supported treatments are seen to be cultivated through human ingenuity, technical proficiency. These things don't necessarily carry a lot of weight in some Indian communities. It's certified by distant and rarefied professional expertise. And of course, it can be dependent on psychological mindedness in ways that um, are not characteristic of everyone in Indian communities. So instead, there's this interest in reclaimed traditional healing practices. We don't want the latest outside uh, approach, the latest and greatest, the one that science vouches for. People will say, our culture is our treatment. We need to look back and recapture and redeploy our own indigenous therapeutic traditions, which tend to be sacred and ceremonial and involve non-human beings as the approach that's going to help our communities. These are obviously then mediated by ritual leaders using prayer and ceremony, and they're dependent on powerful non-humans who circulate blessings and life. 
Finally, when it comes to even knowing whether an intervention works, um, there isn't, in my experience, much interest in scientific outcome studies. Um, scientific outcome studies, as I see them, really extend rationality in important ways that um, experimental and statistical analysis tend to be forms of cognitive prostheses that allow us to know a little more reliably and a little further than we can reason off the tops of our heads. Um, it tends also in science to presume mechanistic materialism. Uh, you know, it's not about spirituality, of course, and also it has to do with mechanism, cause and effect, reliable uh, sorts of uh, linkages between um, this and that. And of course, it adopts a skepticism. Um, it's a selective skepticism. No one is a nihilist who is trying to act for good in the world, but there's a lot of skepticism that's part of the scientific endeavor. Rather, though, when it comes to evaluation, the people I talk to throughout the work that I do emphasize indigenous ways of knowing. This is a pretty broad category. It's sort of still being worked out in many sectors, but I well remember um, going to a ceremonial gathering of the Blackfeet Crazy Dog Society um, back in 2010 or so. And my purpose there was I had started a, a partnership with members of the Blackfeet Addiction Treatment Program in the Blackfeet Nation of Montana. Um, we were thinking about uh, starting with Blackfeet therapeutic traditions for addiction treatment and, and wanting to know what that would look like if those were centered. And so uh, um, the cultural counselor took me to a ceremonial gathering of these uh, uh, society members. And about three hours into the ceremony, they finally turned to us to give us the floor to find out what we wanted, and I expected our cultural counselor to say, well, we're here because we're interested in centering Blackfeet therapy tradition. We want your help in knowing what to do. But instead, the cultural counselor turned to me and said, Joe, you're on. And so um, I uh, quickly explained that we were interested in trying to understand and harness Blackfeet therapeutic tradition for purposes of uh, remedying addiction in the community because uh, psychological scientists do not yet know whether cultural participation in practice can remedy substance use disorders. Before I could even finish, the entire lodge of 30 odd people erupted in laughter. I mean, it was, they were, they thought this was enormously hysterically funny. And after what seemed like a long 45 seconds, you know, the um, circle quieted down. And the leader said, scientists don't know Every single person in this lodge is living proof that these ways, these practices, uh, remedy addiction. And so there's a sense in which the authority of narratively conveyed personal experience is the pinnacle of what authoritative knowledge looks like with indigenous ways of knowing. And this is in part why personal narrative is so, so important in our communities. And it has led to claims and proclamations to center not evidence-based practice, but rather practice-based evidence. How can we, on the basis of our experiences and our understandings um, in Indian communities, um, explain and account for what we know about how therapy can help? Um, therapies of the kind that are indigenous more so than Euro-American. So in terms of abstracting all of this, the alternative science that I have in mind has to do with these four domains. The problem is not mental disorders, but historical trauma. The aspiration is not neoliberal individualism, but relational selfhood. The intervention is not empirically supported treatments, but reclaimed healing practices. And evaluation is not about scientific studies, but about indigenous ways of knowing. Now, what to do in light or response to these sorts of things. In some ways, that's what my career has been about since first recognizing these sorts of challenges or dilemmas, and there's not time today to go into in any depth that would um, uh, explain um, in ways that are being utterly satisfying to you, but so I'm just gonna gesture, and maybe some other time I'll tell you about some of these alternatives. But there is, I think, a way to move toward an anti-colonial mental health that is worth thinking about uh, for mental health providers, researchers, and policymakers in Indian country. How do we navigate the kind of deep cultural discordance that I've tried to point out here? The obvious thing to me is that cultural competence in the way we know it has serious limitations here. Honestly, I don't think it's all that helpful because these are fairly deep. We need to always recognize that clinical intervention is inherently cultural prescription. 
there is no culture-free or a transcendent approach that uh, is not based on assumptions and presumptions and um, knowledge about what makes people tick and how they would respond in certain ways and so on. And particularly in Indian country, we need to acknowledge the hazards of therapy as potential forms of neo-colonial cultural proselytization. That for a very, very long time, Indian people have been told that their approaches, their ways, uh, their life is uh, savage, primitive, crude, and not worthy of uh, recognition or value. And so uh, people are understandably sensitive to outside promises or proclamations that the latest, greatest is way better than anything you know. And I think it leads us to want to consider seriously indigenous claims that, quote, our culture is our treatment, unquote. To start there for a moment and really think through what might that mean and what might that look like. Now again, there's not time to really unpack all that in a way that's going to be satisfying in the time we have left. But the other piece beyond the cultural discordance has to do with these power disparities that I'm alluding to. As uh, formerly colonized, in some cases the colonization continues in really key ways, there are power disparities that are complicating everything that you might, we might do in this field. American Indians are colonized canaries in the coal mine, you might say. The because of American Indian status that has to do with the history of colonization and the vulnerabilities that come with um, being uh, dispossessed in your own homelands, um, the kinds of problems and the kinds of uh, dilemmas that happen in Indian communities are illuminating and helpful for representing uh, broader kinds of uh, approaches and principles that could be useful for mental health in diverse contexts more generally. So I think our position is one that can highlight or accentuate dilemmas and difficulties that generalize out to lots of other communities that may have um, some aspects of, shared some aspects of what we've endured, but not all. Um, there are serious limitations in the EVP evidence base, as you know. Um, I think it was an article 15 years ago now in the Annual Review of Clinical Psychology that showed that of all the RCTs done on empirically supported treatments, uh, something like almost 10,000 clients or patients have participated in all these studies. Exactly zero were American Indian Alaska Native. And so when you are not conducting studies that involve peoples with differing life experiences, the question of generality is really a one that's open. It remains open, and this sort of uncertainty requires a bit of humility on our part. As I've also already mentioned, I think Indian people have long been governed by outsiders who think that they know what's in our best interest. And there's a great sensitivity to being told by outsiders that this is what we should or should not do. Indian communities today exercise semi-sovereign powers of self-governance. Um, we are able to contract from the federal government our own health services, to use federal dollars to run it our own way, which means that there are innovations going on in health and in mental health and in addiction treatment that are quite distinctive um, because there is this sort of on the ground uh, community by community opportunity to exercise self-government uh, in that way. Ultimately, I think the move toward anti-colonial mental health involves flipping the script. It involves not starting with empirically supported treatments and figuring out how to dress that up in beads and feathers, if you will, to make it more appealing, but rather to start with indigenous therapeutic traditions and figure out on that basis, how to accommodate those to service delivery systems to make them available and accessible and hopefully helpful to more Native people. I know that's not totally satisfying. It can't be in the time that I have. Let me, though, close so that we have a little bit of time at least for exchange. There is much diversity among contemporary American Indian people, and I don't want to, in this talk, make you think that there aren't Indian people for whom they were, you know, perfectly suited for psychotherapy. There are people like that, even in reservation settings or what have you, who love psychotherapy and benefit from it. I'm not trying to say that no Indian people can benefit, but I am trying to bring attention to those, and it's a significant swath of people who are not particularly psychologically minded and for whom these things do not necessarily make a lot of sense. There are common misgivings throughout our communities about evidence-based practices and mental health services for the reasons I've tried to describe. Importantly, advocates of evidence-based practice really fail to address these concerns with any sophistication um, and, and to take seriously the 
power and the cultural distinctiveness, uh, the dilemmas, the dynamics that I've tried to uh, recount here. Um, and so let's talk about a little more. Um, a lot of what I had to say today is elaborated in all kinds of ways in the things that I've written, which are largely available here. Um, thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing what you have to say about these things. Yes, please. Uh, one interesting intersection between the area of science and ceremony is the use of um, uh, psychopharmacology in certain reservations, like tobacco in certain tribes, or peyote in San Pedro in the Southwest tribes. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on this and any uh, research that's been done or how you see it as a possible way to bridge uh, uh, the scientific tradition with the ceremonial Indian traditions. One thing is I think that there is a, almost an embargo in many Indian communities against outside research, at least unless or until it's vetted, to be very carefully tailored to the interests and needs and accountable to community members. But I think one form of entry that has real possibility is looking at some of these um, substances that people are using in some cases in therapeutic ways, like Native American church and the peyote rite, for example, which is associated with people either quitting uh, uh, abusive drinking and drugging or refraining from it. Um, there might be possibilities uh, if it's couched in terms of understanding the substance effects, physiological and whatnot, um, that the, there could be a real uh, prospects here. Tobacco I haven't heard too much about. I mean, the public health concern about tobacco has to do with cigarette smoking. Indian people smoke cigarettes you know, at a high, high disparity that's obviously deadly. So there's some sense in which we revere tobacco ceremonially and as a sacred medicine in all kinds of ways at the same time that cigarettes, of course, isn't good for anybody. Um, and so there is a bit of a, a needle to thread around how to take on that public health challenge while also respecting the role that tobacco has played you know, for a very long time. Yes? Could you say, could you say a word about the reported epidemic of women and girls vanishing? Yeah. Um, as you know, there's kind of a social movement that has emerged on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, this originated in Canada, and one of my colleagues in the Anthro Department in Columbia University, Audra Simpson, gave this wonderful talk about how, you know, um, Canadian indigenous women have gone missing or, and family members don't know where they are and the police do nothing about it. And in one case, there was a serial killer in British Columbia who was known to have killed some of these women and buried, had the pigs eat them. And I mean, horrible things like that. And so um, that has as many uh, movements and ideas in indigenous communities in the, the Kansas states, uh, that's you know Canada, US, New Zealand, Australia, um, percolate and circulate. And so we have that here in the United States too that there's concern about this. There's no question that law enforcement is lax when it comes to some of these things. At the same time that sometimes the implication is that it's outsiders or white people who are responsible for all, all this abduction or murder. And the story is a little more complicated than that. I mean, um, even as we want more law enforcement, Presumably that means that more of our people in our communities probably need to cooperate with law enforcement, but then there's long-standing trust issues. Um, and so there are those kinds of concerns around it. But I, it, there's a prototypical sense in Canada of what that means. In the United States, it's a little less clear what it means in some respects. But it's a movement that calls attention to the fact that law enforcement is lax, and that's important. Hi. Thank you. Uh, could you? This is a very broad question, but it, it, how? How? What's the approach to thinking about suicide, both in terms of how to understand it, what? What are their approaches? To how, what, what? What happens in the context of that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole talk. <laughs> um, one thing to say about it is that you know the idea of anomic suicide. You know, you can go back to Durkheim and societies that are kind of going through. Uh, collapse or a breakdown, um, have higher rates of suicide. You can see that in the former Soviet Union. You can see that in white America, working class America today with the opioid epidemic and so on. So there's that sense in which those things uh, tend to accord. Um, it's also the case that a suicide epidemic to the great existing Indian communities is one in which it tends to be younger people rather than old people. Um, 
I've never heard of an Indian person killing themselves because they lost their job in a way you might in middle America. Um, but rather, especially for young people, it's like about romantic breakups and about uh, it's often not so uh, planned or premeditated, rather impulsive. I mean, these are just brush strokes, though, and to really drill down, you have to try to attend to data, and they're hard to come by. I think the point, though, is that um, for young people, uh, relational uh, chaos um, sometimes starts in families that are not functioning very well because of addiction and what have you. And obviously, it's sort of those kind of youth who end up in their teenage years or whatnot being really susceptible to bad outcomes when their first romantic relationship goes off the rails or what have you. So that's an important part of the story to tell. But the research is so limited, it's a little hard and a little hazardous to characterize too much about it. Yeah, sure. How has historical trauma um, changed over the course of your career? And your perspective on it, um, has it always been on the side with it? Or have you uh, gone back and forth with that? Yeah, so historical trauma entered the health literature in the 90s, mid-90s. Um, I think its story um, parallels two things. Um, the growth of kind of psychocentrism in American society, where we tend, through talk shows and self-help and all that sort of thing, tend to think very psychologically about our lives and experiences, and that provides a foundation for thinking about stuff like trauma and historical trauma, but specifically about trauma. So PTSD came online in 1980 with the DSM-3 um, and circulated since then um, in ways that now trauma is a colloquial term. Um, and um, if you want, you know, used to want refuge in the United States from another country, you had to show you had PTSD, for example. So all kinds of phenomena that have come together to lead to trauma um, to be really central to how we think about human frailty and suffering and the ability to rebound from those things. Um, I think for Indian people, it's been interesting because it really wants to contextualize, as I said. So you know, you look at all these social problems, the high rates of addiction in some communities, and people can just feel blamed about those things and feel paralyzed by the fact that there's something deficient with them. But historical trauma is a way of socializing and historicizing those kinds of experiences, making them collective, anchoring them to the history of colonization, and suddenly it's not so paralyzing. It can be a group of people with this recognition who can take steps they wouldn't otherwise have taken. And so I think it's been really helpful in that way, even as we want to recognize that historical trauma as a way of talking about the colonial legacy is still somewhat medicalizing, um, and there's some concern, in my part at least, about what it means to medicalize the social in this respect. What would we do differently if we weren't thinking of it as psychological trauma, but rather as grave injustice and need of remedy? And at that, we're at 1 o'clock, so thank you, Dr. Gump. Thank you.